Baby Jesus. That's what it's about. Children. Hope. I was with some friends the other day, and one of their, we were Thanksgiving time, and the children in the backyard playing, and one who's had some struggles in life was looking out at the children and said, wow, if only I could go back to that time of life, right? We have our stresses and worries as adults, so, but Christmas is about a child to Take away some of the stress, some of the worry to give us hope. That's ultimately the message of Christmas. We'll reflect on that tonight. I want to propose a vision to you tonight, uh, using four points. A vision of what life could be like. A vision of what we could be like. What we were intended to be by God. A vision of a world where people are good. I was working in the office last night, and I heard these fire engines, sirens, and kind of ebbing and flowing, getting loud and then receding, and then getting loud again. And I thought, my gosh, there must be a bad accident. And they started getting louder and louder. I looked out the window, and I saw four fire trucks driving by right through the neighborhood. And then on the fourth one, I saw they were carrying a big sled in Santa Claus. The firefighters were embracing goodness yesterday. Today, bringing some joy to our neighborhoods, lifting spirits, tough men acting childlike for a little while, doing a little act of goodness, right? And there's a lot of goodness at Christmas. Why can't it continue all year long? Why is it so difficult? So let's imagine a world where people embrace goodness all year, where people serve those in need around us rather than being self-centered and greedy. Indifferent, a world where family members put each other first, are patient with each other, are faithful, rather than falling into infidelity and selfishness. A world where people in our cities practice forgiveness and patience rather than violence. A world where individuals do what they know is right and good rather than compulsively feeding their appetites and addictions. A world where people have a sense of their immeasurable value and worth rather than viewing themselves as worthless, thinking of harming themselves. I have a vision of this kind of world, this kind of life. Is it possible? And Christmas tells us yes. We know this is a hopeful time of year. Sometimes we can't put into words why it is. We know it's so good to be here tonight. It feels so good. It is good. But sometimes we struggle to identify why. So tonight we want to propose that vision of life the second point is we ask, why isn't life more like that? Why can't that be true? Because we've been exposed to another vision of life, a vision that shoots too low, a vision of humans as kind of bundles of desire, appetites seeking to be desired, to be satisfied, almost like animals. We exist to satisfy our desires. We seek pleasure. Where does this vision come from? God proposes the first vision of what life could be. The adversary, the one who wants to rob us of life, proposes this second vision. And there's a struggle between the two for our souls, for our hearts and our minds. But Christmas reminds us that God is seeking us. God says joy is found in putting others first, serving God and others. That's where we truly will find joy. But the adversary says, no, you can't have true joy. But you can have pleasure if you serve yourself. But it's a lie. And if we follow that lie, it leads to unhappiness. It leads to hurt. So this struggle goes on above us, between God and the adversary. The struggle goes on within us, right? Our own struggle between doing what is good and doing what is bad. The good news is that Christmas, at Christmas, the supernatural invaded the world. It's a way of looking at it. The supernatural came into the natural. God the Son came to earth as a baby boy. You see his image here in the stable. And he was accompanied by an army of angels, St. Luke tells us in the Gospel. The word host, it's kind of a tame word. It means army. 
because they were coming to rescue us from the lie, to make possible that first vision, to live a generous and significant and joyful life. So the third point is an encouragement. Become the new person. I watched a movie the past few weeks called The Man Who Invented Christmas. Some of you might have seen it. It's about Charles Dickens. He was an English writer, 1800s, but he wrote this story, The Christmas Carol. It's been remade in many different versions. And in the story, he created a lot of the images of Christmas that we still have today, the Christmas carols, the parties, the charity to the poor. But the story is centered upon a greedy man, self-centered man named Scrooge, right? Ebenezer Scrooge. He's a miser. He never shares with others. He doesn't have sympathy for others. He doesn't have friends. Very money-centered. But he was shown his own insignificance one Christmas Eve when a ghost appeared to him. And the ghost gave him a vision. He showed Scrooge a cemetery, and there was a rich man's funeral, but it was unattended. The only people there was the funeral home attendants, because no one cared and no one mourned. And Scrooge realized that was his own funeral. That's where his life was headed unless he changed. So the question is, can someone who's so self-centered, can they change? Apparently, Dickens, when he was writing the story, didn't think such a person could change. He was kind of reflecting on the, the good and the bad in life. But he came to realize that the spirit of Christmas, the Holy Spirit, can change even big sinners. So he rewrote the ending of his story. And Scrooge did change that Christmas. For those who've seen it, the movie or the book, read it, you know. So the possibility of change is the Christmas story. In the beginning, God created a man to start the human race on earth. His name was Adam. And Adam was given everything good in the Garden of Eden, but he wasn't satisfied, just like Scrooge. And Adam messed up, didn't he? The adversary tempted him. The adversary appeared to him and tempted Adam to turn against God and to disobey God. Adam fell victim to the lie that happiness comes from selfishly seeking pleasure rather than living for others. This was the lie. Ages passed after that. Humans continued to struggle, caught between these two visions of life, continually falling into hurt and into sin. But then God sent another man, didn't he? A new Adam. His name was Jesus in Bethlehem. And as he grew up, Jesus too was tempted by the adversary. Remember in the desert for 40 days before he began his public work. But he didn't mess up. No, he chose to obey God the Father. He embraced his Father's will. He lived to serve others. And he reproposed that vision to us. But coming as a man in Bethlehem, as one of us, Jesus, the new Adam, showed just how dignified we are as humans. Sometimes we forget that. We are not mere pleasure-seeking beings. God became like us to show that in some sense we are to be like God. We have a mind that can know, that can think, that know the difference between right and wrong. We have a, a will that can choose to love. We can choose to serve others. We can say no to ourselves and yes to others. We have that capacity, even though sometimes we're very weak. And that this is the significant life, the satisfying life. And God wants to help us live it, to become the new Adam, the new man, the new woman. And how do we do that? And that brings us to our fourth and final point. God wants to come in. He doesn't want to just come down to be with us, to be with us. He wants to be in us. This is what Christians understand. That is such good news that other people on earth don't know yet. He wants to send his spirit, the spirit of God, into our souls. We call that grace. To motivate us, to empower us, to become the new you. The new Tom, or the new Julie, the new Susan, or the new John. St. Paul speaks of this in his letter tonight, his letter to Titus. Paul says, the grace of God has appeared, strengthening us to reject godless ways and worldly desires and to live temperately and justly and devoutly. Jesus Christ appeared to deliver us from lawlessness and to cleanse us. 
Paul says that Jesus came to earth in order to give us grace. And he continues to do so today, some 2,000 years later, through the church. And this parish, St. Philip Mary, is a school, in a sense. This is the school where we learn week by week how to do that. Every seven days, we come again for another lesson, another reminder, another experience of grace. This gradual process of becoming the new you begins with baptism, right, when the Holy Spirit enters into our soul. It continues every time we receive Holy Communion at Mass, as we will do tonight, bringing God into our body and soul, into communion with Him. It continues every time we contemplate His words in Bible study, bringing his words into our mind, renewing our mind, helping us to think as he thinks. And it continues every time we invite his spirit into our soul in our personal prayer at home. Little by little, Jesus helps us to realize the vision that Isaiah proclaimed in our first reading. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Upon those who dwelt in the land of gloom, a light is shone. The yoke that burdened them and the pole on their shoulder, you have smashed, O Lord, and you have brought them great joy. Let God lift the darkness, show us our true human dignity and worth. Let him give us the grace to live life as it was intended to be, a life of service, of significance, and of joy. Like the firemen. And so, my brothers and sisters, in this new year, let Jesus, the new Adam, come into your mind and into your heart. In this new, year, the new you. Christmas tells us that it's possible. Amen.